Good afternoon and welcome to our celebration of service. I'm Ron Barnes and it's an honor to be the president of this wonderful club. I have a quote for you today, the quote of the day. It's only after you've stepped outside your comfort zone that you can be begin to change, grow and transform. Roy T. Bennett. Now for the real reflection, a colleague and friend of mine, Jim Harvey. Thank you for this opportunity to reflect for a moment on the activities and impact of the Rotary Foundation. At my age, there are some things in life that you never want to see or hear of again. I began elementary school in 1947. One of the most telling memories of my childhood is of classmates who had polio. Bill was a grade behind me, and he was paralyzed from the waist down. He used two crutches to move around. Jeannie was a grade ahead of me. She spent years in an iron lung, which helped her breathe. Some of you may never have seen an iron lung. Just imagine living all day, every day in a device the size of a water heater lying on its side. Wow. I never want to see this again. Jonas Salk developed a vaccine for polio. I was one of thousands of school-age kids in the United States who lined up at the nurse's office to get a sugar cube with a drop of the vaccine. I did not get polio. The vaccine was too late for Phil, Jeannie, and millions of others around the world. I never want to hear this again. Fast forward to 1997. My wife, Sally, a teacher, received a Lilly Teacher Creativity Fellowship. Her grant took her back to, to Malawi in Sub-Saharan Africa, where she had previously studied. She delivered presentations on education in many schools, some of which were just for pupils who had polio. Yes, in schools where all the pupils were crippled. I never want to hear about them again. Rotary launched Polio Plus in 1985. It was the first initiative to tackle global polio eradication through mass vaccination of children. Rotary has contributed more than $2 billion and countless volunteer hours to immunize more than 3 billion children in 122 countries. As of last Tuesday, only two countries on earth remain polio endemic. Polio with five, Afghanistan, with five cases in 2023 and Pakistan with two. You know about vaccines. The polio vaccine works and has worked for decades. Please help finish the job. Please donate to the Rotary Foundation today. It would be fine with me if I never hear of polio again. Thank you, Jim. And to introduce our guests, we have Steve Engel. Well, I'm delighted to introduce our guests today. And as I call your names, would you please stand up so we can recognize and welcome you? Uh, first uh, guest of Dr. Patrick Smith is Victor Agonke, and he's a grad student here at IU. Welcome, Victor. <clears throat> Secondly, is a guest of Sally Gaskell, Maria Walker, 
Maria. There you go. <laughs> and last, uh, I guess of Tracy Jovanovic is Yvonne Nye. Yvonne? We're delighted to have you here. And uh, if you are, of, uh, are interested in learning more about Rotary, just ask anyone here, but thanks for coming. Thank you, Steve. And Joy Harder has a special guest to introduce. Come on up, yes. And maybe even an announcement to make today too. Hi, everyone. So my guest is currently standing and just got his lunch. Say hi, Ethan. <laughs> uh, it, is my, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce our Rotary family to another member of our Rotary family. Ethan is the current president of the Rotaract Club. And so we warmly welcome you, Ethan. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, now you can sit down and eat your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Kyla, any um, guests online? We do have a guest, a guest of Judy Schroeder, John Weichart, who many of you know, is with us as a guest today. Welcome, John. Thanks, Kyla. And we do have some birthdays to celebrate. Uh, two of them were yesterday. Uh, Dakir Abdullah uh, was on August 28th. Kevin Hopper Knutstrom, August 28th. And today, our past president, Winston Schindel, has a birthday. On August 30th, Mike Hoff and Shelley Yoder have birthdays. Congratulations to all of you. We have some member anniversaries also. Emily Hannon, one year. Leslie Green, 21 years. And Charlie Osborne, 30 years. So. We honor you and your service to Rotary. We have several announcements, so bear with us. First of all, uh, like Monroe Day, um, Michelle Cohen is here to uh, encourage you to sign up to help uh, this community service project that we've engaged in. Michelle? Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to alert you to the events that the Friends of Lake Monroe has proposed for a whole week to celebrate Lake Monroe and the fact that it provides a wonderful resource for our community. And the Rotary um, Club has supported this work through the district grant. So it's partially sponsored by Rotary and they are seeking some volunteers. There's a sign up link that um, Jim Bright sent around in the announcement for today's meeting, and that will be going out in the newsletter and on Facebook as well. So where you can see me to sign up, the week itself is September 14th through the 21st. I do want to remind you that uh, the Rotary Toast is filling up rather quickly. It's November 3rd, and if you and a partner or spouse plan to attend, uh, I would encourage you to sign up ASAP. And uh, also, uh, we have several Rotarians involved in Blackie Brown Festival, which will be on September 9th at Switchlard Park. Rotary will have a table. Uh, our Rotarian, Jim, Jimmy Torrey, will be manning the table, but uh, you're welcome to stop by or join Jimmy at this great event in our city. Also, uh, there will be a Rotary presence at the Fiesta Deal on Terrell, on Tono on September 16th. There'll be more on this. So uh, opportunity for our community to celebrate our diversity. I would like to um, now ask uh, Jim Shea if he will come up and introduce our program. And I also should say that Maria Walker, who we introduced, kind of knows the speaker rather well. So uh, uh, <laughs> without further ado, Mr. Shea. Hello, Rotarians. What a great day we have to gather here at the Union. 
well, I am delighted to introduce my old buddy, Ron Walker. I haven't seen enough of Ron since I retired, so it's good to reconnect today, Ron. Uh, Ron came to Bloomington to uh, get a master's degree in public administration. It's been a few years ago. Uh, but like a lot of us, he decided, not a bad town, maybe I'll just stick around. Um, so since then, he has contributed to Bloomington in our region in a number of important ways. He was economic development coordinator for Mer Monroe County. He was a project manager for the strategic development group, which does consulting all over. He was director of economic development for the city of Bloomington. He was president of the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation for seven years, BEDC. Uh, and during that time, I was at the Luddy School and Ron and I were involved in a fair number of pitches to companies to come to Bloomington. Um, I was always so impressed with how he handled himself and he represented Bloomington in a very classy way. Uh, I must say I was a little slightly surprised when he made the move to CFC, um, but I guess I shouldn't have been because Cook knows talent and Ron knows where to go to make an impact. Um, Ron became president of CFC this year, about three months ago, when longtime president Jim Murphy, who I'm sure many of you know, retired. Uh, and so good for CFC and good for Ron. And I am delighted to welcome him to Rotary. Let's give him a good Rotary welcome. Well, you made me feel really good, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. I am, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm familiar with this group. It's been many years since I've, I've been to one of these luncheons, but I'm so familiar with how much impact and good you've done. And uh, it's, it's great to see and hear that you've grown. You've continued to grow. And I'm also really excited to be here just because I, I love what we're doing at Cook uh, with Workforce Housing. So I'm very excited about that. I want to add a couple of things not on this uh, presentation that uh, uh, Maria and I met while we were graduate students here at Indiana University. We have three kids. Two of them are enrolled here. Uh, one is a junior. One, I guess he's in his second week as a freshman. Um, we're hoping to set eyes on him today while we're on campus and uh, check in. And then third, I, I want to say um, we're, we're parents of a 14-year-old of a girl who's at Bloomington South. And like many parents who have teenage daughters, we have been embroiled in trying to get Taylor Swift tickets. All five of us registered for the Indianapolis concert over a year from now. All five of us were put on the wait list, which is a polite way of saying this is never going to happen. And then we've tried all of these um, contests to try to get her to a concert. And then last week, I'm traveling and Maria reaches out and she says, you will not believe it. I've got a ticket to the hottest event in town. I said, you're kidding me. She said, Sally Gaskell invited me to the Rotary Luncheon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the universe works in mysterious ways and here we are. So um, quickly, I'm gonna talk about building houses and building communities. Um, we're definitely doing the first part and we're hoping to do the second part. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to the end for a quick second and tell you what we're doing at Cook. And then I'm gonna explain how we got there. We are building houses at cost to us and offering them first to Cook employees for purchase only with zero strings attached to remain an employee of Cook, okay? So I'm gonna get into what we're doing. So Cook means many things. We all use the word Cook. Um, Cook is primarily a medical device company, but Cook is also an addition to devices, it's life sciences, it's services, it's real estate. That's who I work for, CFC Properties. And then it's um, hospitality, if you know French Lick and West Baden. 
uh, two very, very special projects. Uh, this, is our, this is where we were founded by Bill and Gail, and this remains our global headquarters. So let's jump into why are we doing this? I probably don't need to tell this group. Um, there is a shortage of single family housing everywhere really, um, but certainly in South Central Indiana. I've bolded the areas that I think are most important to what I'm gonna talk about, but it's a shortage of single family housing. It's a shortage of housing that people can afford to buy. If you know anything about real estate in Bloomington, you would most likely nod in approval of that, but this exists outside of Monroe County as well. So why would we as a private employer try to take a lead on tackling this? It's a, it's a good question. We've asked ourselves this question many, many times. Um, a couple reasons. One, we hear from employees about their struggles, about their challenges. They're commuting long distances to work. Gas is expensive, it's time. Um, we also selfishly want some stability in our workforce. We don't wanna lose them. Uh, we wanna offer good benefits to them. We wanna be a preferred employer. And then secondly, government and, and really communities in general, they could use a little help. We can't, we can't always look and say they should do this because they may not be able to do that on their own. We have resources, we have a lot of experience in real estate, and we wanna see our communities thrive. We know in the communities that we operate in, Bloomington, Spencer, Ellettsville, Orange County, if the community starts to decline and starts to struggle, that will hurt us. It'll hurt our ability to recruit. It'll hurt our ability to operate. So we wanna help if we can, and hopefully we benefit as an employer. So who needs it? Well, first let's kind of revisit, not enough single family housing, not enough houses that you can afford. So we began to look at Cook employees and we began to look at this 60 to 120% of area median income. It's not necessarily affordable housing in the space in the traditional sense, but it is housing for the workers. And if you were to look up workforce housing over the course of history, to me, I find that it, it often means your service sector or people on the front lines in a community. Think of police, fire, teachers, assemblers, production workers, folks who really, they, they run your community. They make the things happen. They build things. And, and the economics and a number of other reasons have pushed housing out of their reach in many cases. And so we began to look at it as almost part of the American dream. Owning a home is often implied in that. And it's become harder and harder for people to achieve that. And so we thought, well, we can, let's try to help. So what does an employer do typically? Well, maybe they, maybe they can give an employee a little bit of money to help with something. Maybe they can make a loan. CFC Properties, which is now a real estate company, started as Cook Financial Corp. It was a credit union for Cook employees. That didn't last very long. I don't know why. Maybe it wasn't needed. Uh, maybe it was fraught with problems. I'm not sure, but that was 40 years ago. And then when Bill and Gail Cook began buying and repurposing beautiful old properties like the Cochran House and Grand Plaza and Town Square, they needed a company to put that in. And CFC existed and we became a property ownership and management, management company of, of really not of anyone else's assets, but of assets owned by Cook. And that's what we've been doing for years. So a lot of, if you knew Jim Murphy, you've probably heard him say a lot of the properties we own are historic. Some are just old and a little difficult, um, but they, they helped revitalize downtown Bloomington. And um, so we're really, we're really proud of them. So as, as you think about Cook, buying and repurposing buildings and owning apartments and for the purpose of revitalizing a downtown and then bring yourself back a few years. I'm like, well, you know, downtown Bloomington is doing pretty well. It's very active. There's a lot of new investment. Let's look to the next area of need and that's housing. So we've sold several of our, our assets and we've put that, those funds aside to build housing. And that's what we're doing right now. 
So you think of all these things that you can do and what's missing. Houses are missing. You can offer down payment assistance, low interest loans, everything, but none of it brings a house out of the ground and gives somebody a, a selection to make. So what I've given you here are um, a picture of two houses we built. This is our first model. We built two of them next to each other in West Baden. If you look beyond these homes up on the hill, that's the Pete Dye golf course. Uh, we started in West Baden because think of rural Orange County. There has not been a new subdivision built there since the 1960s. The Cooks invest millions of dollars. West Baden and French Lick are up and running and they're doing fantastically, by the way. They, I think, are setting um, records this year for, for visitors. And we have over a thousand people working there at peak times. And there's hardly any place for them to live. So they're commuting from multiple counties. And now we're in this very tight labor market. Um, people have the remote option and we are at risk. And the employees were letting us know, hey, we need, we need help. So, and then the pandemic came along. I'm like, well, this is a challenge, but maybe it's an opportunity for us. We had to close the resorts. We had to furlough people, but we still had to maintain the properties. So we just started building the houses then. We have our mm -hmm. own folks on the property that can do maintenance and construction. And we set aside a small crew and we started building houses. So we've now built 12 houses in West Baden. All 12 are sold. They all sold for under $200,000. And that's what you're seeing there. These are three bedroom, two bath homes. And we are probably in the third quarter of this year, starting on the next project, which will be in French Lick, which will have 27 homes. Uh, roughly in that price range. So I got involved because we came up here to our region and we started looking at, at Spencer. We have 600 plus people there. We have a lot of people commute into Monroe County from Owen County. It's only a 30 minute drive. Spencer has been very focused, very active. They are wanting houses. Uh, their community had declined a little bit in population. Their public school corporation had declined. And we convened a meeting there and within 48 hours had every public leader in that community inside of a conference room. And all of them said, how do we get it done? How do we help you? It was amazing. And they've stayed true to that approach and purpose um, to this day. So we bought an area that I call it Texas Pike Place because it's right off of Texas Pike. And if you, if you know Spencer at all, let me see if this can work. The courthouse in downtown Spencer is right here. If you go past that, this is Cook. This is Owen Valley High School. We bought 62 acres bordered in yellow there. And we set out with our civil engineers to lay out what we think are roughly third of an acre lots. They're pretty good size lots for a new new development. They're about 100 feet wide, 150 feet deep. Some of them, because they're irregular in a cul-de-sac, are over an acre in size. And we committed to building 99 houses. And um, it has been a challenge. I think you mentioned getting out of your comfort zone. This was totally out of my comfort zone. Um, very stressful at times, but a wonderful experience and a great learning opportunity. That is our layout. It looks very complicated. Um, we've got some wetland features in the middle. That's why we have two cul-de-sacs. Um, we had a land, there was a natural land bridge there. So we have an eight foot path we'll do connecting those, those two. Um, we are in a, a, a rural electric cooperative out there. They are bringing underground electric services to every single home and they're bringing underground fiber to every single home. And I think that's what people should begin to expect in a, in a new development. This is an example of uh, one of our popular models. It's called the Hayden. It's built by Authentic Homes. They're a, they're a, a Monroe County builder. And um, I think this one you're looking at is a little over 1400 square feet. Our first 14 homes, this is kind of a pilot, right? So um, we're a little nervous since we started, when we started this interest rates were three and a half percent and now they're seven. Um, if you are on the cusp of home ownership, the ability to afford a home, 
that might mean 200 to $300 a month difference to you. It might knock you out of contention. So we have worked really, really hard to keep our prices uh, low. And um, so what we're doing is we're building them. And our, our model is let's build it, let's sell it at what it cost us. We, we sell it, we turn around, we just keep building. We are not trying to make any money at this at all. Um, the investment is in a sense long-term for us and for our communities. I don't wanna lose money at it. Um, and we might, but I hope just not to lose too much money at it um, and, and we keep going. But most of them have this similar floor plan in phase one. Some of them have nine foot ceilings. Some of them have cathedral ceilings. Um, we do recessed lighting, laminate flooring. Um, we supply brand new stainless steel appliances, including a washer and dryer. They tend to have better appliances than I have. Um, and, uh, but you know, we want them to move into a house and not have to do anything to begin sleeping and cooking in their house that next day. That's already gonna be a challenge. Um, so we really wanna remove all those barriers and just get people into a home if that's what they wanna do. So this is, if any of you have ever done anything with property development, you might see some significance to this. We began meeting, we bought property December, we had our plat approved in June. Then we realized we, we didn't make our, our wetland area large enough. So we went back and amended it. And we started doing some mass grading. We pulled building permits. We started houses. We did all that within 12 months. In many communities, you would be, you might be two years out before you get any of that. And that's how, how supportive they were, and we're following all of the um, criteria and the guidelines, of course, federal, state, and local. But that's just how we were able to get it done, um, because time was time was moving quickly, and uh, we needed to get we needed to get homes for people. So this yellow area up top is our phase one. We've built 14 homes there. Um, I'm very happy to say we closed on our ninth one yesterday, so we're moving along. The light blue area with uh, the new numbers, that's phase two. So we've just started on those. And um, we, we decided, you know, we've heard from some folks that have families and you think a three bedroom house, you can't really, if you got a big family, you can't fit very well in that. Um, so we said, well, let's build some four bedroom homes. And we were a little nervous about that because they're more expensive. But um, so I put out something to all the cook employees said, hey, we're thinking about building a four bedroom house. Let me know if you're interested. We're gonna build four. I think I've got three of them already um, lined up with buyers. So we're really happy about that. That's a four bedroom house that is almost 1900 square, square feet. So keep in mind, these are what we might've called at one point a starter home. They're, they're, they're basic houses, but they are very, very good and very well built. Here's a, here are some photos of them. On the left, that's uh, one of our guys, that's Dave Ferrand. Uh, He's having fun working out there because it's really peaceful and quiet. And um, we, we, um, we laid sod down on all of the front yards because we really wanted them to feel like they're in a neighborhood the minute they move in. And um, it was kind of challenging because when you put sod down in the summer, you have to water it constantly. And um, so, you know, we, these are all the things we start thinking about. Well, shoot, if we're going to do that, now we've got to take care of it for another month. Uh, before they move in. And then these heavy rains came. And in some cases, they picked up the sod and moved it. And um, so we got to go back. And then there have been some major storms in Owen County in the past two months, right after we finish all the homes. Um, a huge storm hits. We have significant damage. And we immediately learned we have to replace every single roof on it. Um, we finished that up about two weeks ago. Um, it was one of the best insurance policies we've probably ever purchased. Uh, um, so, but you're buying a new house. Uh, you, you need to have a new roof. Uh, so we did it. So here's a picture of uh, one of the insides. Some of the bathrooms, we have this really nice um, tiling. Some of them have, you know, step in showers with a, with a fiberglass surround. We just, we just vary it up a little bit because um, everybody has different preferences. Here's a picture of some of the kitchens. 
And um, it looks like I've added color to that photo, but I haven't, it was just a beautiful day there. Um, and so, and that's, that's where we are. So we're really, really thrilled about this and uh, really happy that we've got nine people already moved in. And, um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the other things that we need to do. You can build a house all day long, but if you haven't worked with people to help them understand the home buying process and building credit and what people look for in a credit score, how you improve it, then you've only gone part of the way. And so we began writing things to the Cook employees. We, we did what we call the cafeteria roadshow. I'd go and set up in the cafeterias and just have information out and let people come up and talk and ask questions. And this is long before we, we, we knew exactly what we had. But, um, and they're a little shy at first. The engineers come up and, they, and it's, it's almost like they're calculating in their hand. And they say, I will be ready on August 5th uh, to purchase a home. They're incredibly good planners. And then others are kind of shy and pretty soon they've opened up about everything in their life. And you learn a lot about them. And it's, it's really been great. We've, we've just made a lot of good relationships with people. But we also created an intra-company website to post information. We brought in the Owen County Chamber of Commerce as our primary partner. Um, they promote the houses on their website, they have an application, they have our covenants for the property. Um, and we did that because it's important to them, but also we are selling to Cook employees. And we started this by building 14 houses. And then we said, applications are open, apply for a house. You have to be pre-approved to apply. So we taught them about pre-approval, we brought banks in, and we did almost like a, a showroom floor with a bunch of banks and employees could just come in and talk to them, including the USDA. And we said, you apply, the chamber will take your application and we do a random drawing. Right? We didn't wanna be the builder and the employer and then deciding who gets to buy the house. So it was random. If you applied for one of the 14 houses, you were the first one drawn, you get your pick of the 14 houses. Number two gets the remaining pick, pick of the remaining 13, so on and so forth. It worked pretty well. I don't think I want to do that part again, but um, it worked pretty well. And we have all 14, um, I think, under contract already. And so we're working towards closing. Two of them are not going to Cook employees. We'll give Cook employees enough time, and then we open it up to others in the community um, to, to apply. So, so that's a big part of that is we like to say we wanna meet the employees where they are. We wanna help them learn about buying a house and give them the resources to help them, in a sense, help themselves. And uh, so far it's, it's worked really well. We've, we've, we've uh, got a lot of happy folks. Uh, showing up to a closing with a, a young couple or an individual who's about to buy a house. If you remember buying one of your first houses, you're a nervous wreck. Right, and then your hands cramping by the end of it because you've signed so many things. And you should never look at, I learned, how much you actually pay over the course of, of time. Um, but um, they're buying homes. We, we, these homes, by the way, are selling for, the smallest one is 188.5. The most expensive one, the little over 1500 square feet is 212.5. They are appraising immediately higher than what you bought it for because we're selling it at cost, okay? So how did we make it work? Well, we partnered with a lot of people. Um, the Chamber of Commerce, Owen County, the town of Spencer agreed to extend sanitary sewer and build a lift station, uh, probably close to $400,000 for the small town of Spencer. Um, we bordered the town, so we agreed to do a voluntary annexation. The town's commitment served as a match for us to also go for ready funds through Regional Opportunities Initiative, a regional organization um, that's been incredible to work for or work with. And uh, we applied for use of ready funds and we received approval for funds to pay for the public infrastructure on this project. If we didn't have that, then our costs would be so high that we wouldn't be able to sell these for around $200,000. So 
So it's taken a, just a, a huge, huge effort. And it's been a true partnership. We know that communities needed help, but we also told them we can't do it alone. We need your help. So what they're gonna get are 99 homes inside of the town of Spencer. That's a lot of families and people buying groceries, um, going to the dentist office, volunteering for youth sports and those kind of things. And then lastly, I wanna just mention some covenants. We didn't do an HOA, they're expensive, they can be challenging in this type of neighborhood. But we said, these homes have to be owner occupied, period. We want people to have the opportunity to grow equity and grow wealth. It's the way most of us in this country, it's our, it's our, it's our one shot at growing wealth in this country for many, many people. So we, they have to be owner occupied. Two, we don't want people coming in and flipping them in three years. We know they're gonna be appraised higher than what we sold them for. So if you wanna come in and flip them in three years, we have the right to buy it back from you at the price we sold it to you, okay? After year three and for the next five years, sell it if you want, we get the first right of refusal. So if Ron makes an offer on a house for 300, that home seller comes to me it says, we have an offer. I have seven days to say, I'll match that offer or we pass. And that's only if uh, we did it in case we had a demand among Cook employees still and we needed to, to try to keep it in the mix. But, and then lastly, we've had some great, great media coverage. That's Steve Ferguson there. I think you probably know him. I am privileged to work with him. I credit him with this vision. And I just like being in the room with a guy and uh, absorbing and learning as much as I can. Um, NPR did a national story on us. Indiana Public Media was out there last week. A French television station picked up on it, TF1. Some of you know who they are probably. Their Washington Bureau picked up, came and did a story. They were really fun. I've watched it. I have no idea what they said in any of it. I just hope it's good. And then uh, that's Tommy below. She was a first time home buyer, a USDA direct loan recipient. And um, it's emotional when you talk to Tommy is how important it is to her. And that's an overhead shot of our development about two weeks ago. Um, you can see the new houses there and where we're starting on the next 13, we've started pouring foundations. So we're really excited about this. We're gonna be doing this for a few years. And that's it, um, except for questions. Are we okay on time, Ron? Good. I know where you are. <laughs> okay, excuse me if I, I know this, I shouldn't bring it up because you didn't say anything, but what you did not talk about was Monroe County. And, you know, I went to a meeting, I think about six years ago with a bunch of people talking about buying affordable housing here. And, uh, your, your Pete, Pete Yonkman was there, and, and he was the only one who made some sense, which said that, that, um, that people, your cook people had been surveyed, and what did they want? Did they want to be in an apartment building with 5,000 students or not, or what did, would they prefer? And they said small, small homes with, with a garden, which is what you're doing in all these other counties. Um, I don't want you to have, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, 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 but do you, can you see overcoming some hurdles to, to be able to do that here as well? And we're maybe working with the university, making it even harder. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay to put me on the spot, Charlotte. I'm glad it was you. Um, um, your memory of it is correct. Pete spoke at an event. Uh, with a developer trying to build workforce housing. And um, to be honest, it was following that that we kind of collectively said, we're going outside of Monroe County. Um, now, there's a little bit of a, of a mechanics part to that. The math doesn't work as well in Bloomington and Monroe County. The, the property values are expensive, but that's okay. You overcome that with, with subsidy and support for public infrastructure. So yeah, we're going elsewhere. Um, we found readiness to work with us 
um, we found support. I'd like us to come back and do this. I, I've, we're actually talking about it a little bit, Charlotte, um, hoping that in the next few years, there, there might be a situation where that can happen. Um, the need is great in Monroe County and our employees would like us to do it in Monroe County. So, um, so yeah, it's a good question. I hope we can get past it, but it has been a challenge. Also not to put you on the spot, but um, so for like wages, your average employee uh, versus cost of home, uh, can pretty much any cook employee afford one of those homes? Or is it sort of like, uh, like I don't know, I guess middle management type of thing? No, it's, it's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say that every employee could afford one. If you're, if you're very new um, uh, on the line, production, you know, on the entry level, then, then and you're a single wage earner, you might not be able to afford one of these yet. So it's not for everybody. Our, we, we really tried to price them so that household incomes be, between maybe 45 and up um, could be eligible for this. So, you know, one of the buyers that I showed you earlier is a USDA direct loan recipient. That means that household income is under $60,000 and they bought a $200,000 house with it. So depending on that, if you're, if you're a two income household, then yeah, you're definitely gonna be able to afford these. We haven't seen anybody um, that really wanted to get turned away from it. But of course that also gets challenging when interest rates go up to seven. So it gets a little, gets a little, little tricky at that point. But we, we know it's not necessarily for everybody. We are not limiting Cook employees to wages based on wages at this point. There hasn't been enough demand to do that. Um, so anybody can apply, but the people who are applying are in that middle income category. Yeah. Have you considered duplexes? And I know you said that employees preferred single family homes, but in places where there really is a housing shortage, have you considered apartments? Yes, um, primarily on the duplex side. Um, there's a part of our property out there in Spencer on the other side of a ephemeral stream or an intermittent stream that it doesn't make as much sense to put single family houses there. So we've thought about um, some sort of paired housing concept. Um, I, I think housing is going to become more difficult for, for people to buy. I also think what we buy will change over time and that we're simply going to see more condominiums and paired housing in the future because the, because of this, the lack of space and the, and the cost. So yeah, we are looking, we are looking at that. But we were just focused on, let's go with the people wanted a single family home. So let's, let's start there. But I, I have a feeling we'll end up doing some of that. Hey, real quick, Ron, just to follow up on that. Have you looked at, have you seen the co-housing project that Lauren's doing behind the YMCA? Yes. So yeah. that kind of follows in that vein. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yes, I wondered, having built a home in the last three years or so myself, I wondered about warranty. Like, do you have a builder's warranty or do they work with CFC for warranty? And how do all those kind of things work? Do you come back after a year and see if there's any issues to follow up? Like, I remember nail pops like nobody, right? So yeah. how, what happens with yeah. all that? We, they all have warranties um, on them. I think our standard on the house is... Uh, there are warranties that go longer than that based on certain foundation and certain aspects of a home, but we're typically doing a, a one year. And then I've told every, and it's on the builder primarily, because what we did is we hired a builder to build a house. And so the risk is not on the builder. They know we're the developer, we're in charge of getting the buyer. We're, we're simply paying them to build it for us, but they're carrying the warranties on them. And so when we have a problem, we call them. I've told every buyer, we're not going anywhere. Um, this has Cook's name on it. It has our reputation. So we're going to be there for you. Uh, and I fully expect we will. But... Just real quick. Is there any questions online? Oh. All right. Hey, I mean, this is a softball question, Ron, but uh, it's not about housing. It's about your wonderful family. They are so talented. How do you get to all their performances and keep straight in such a talented bunch? <laughs> that is a very good question. You know, you, you, they're worth going to. So um, that's, that's a priority, right? I skip meals is what I do. And uh, 
and I make it, but that's so kind of you. I am blessed to have a, a family of wonderful singers and actors and performers. And, um, I love it when our worlds intersect like this. Now we're getting totally off topic, um, but thank you for that. Yeah. Hi, um, I wanted to follow up on the um, middle density housing question, the duplexes, triplexes. One of the more recent criticisms of single family housing is that it doesn't tend to generate enough tax revenue yeah. for maintenance of the infrastructure over 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Has there been any consideration to um, preventing these problems from arising you know, a generation from now in these developments? Well, there's been consideration by the town of Spencer. So everything we build out there that's public um, we have to build to their standards, of course, and then at some point, I think a year after annexation, if it's complete, then we it's conveyed to the town of Spencer, right? So the question is, what happens in, you know, year five when a pipe has a problem? And what you're doing is you're collecting tax revenue, property tax revenue on a single family home that's probably worth 250000 and what they're paying in taxes is reduced by a homestead exemption and other things. Um, so it's a good, it's a good kind of a mathematical look ahead. Um, the town of Spencer is, is going to do a residential TIF district, a tax increment finance district, to help pay for that. That will not generate a lot, but over time, these are new, new houses, new infrastructure. We shouldn't have any major repairs on any, any of the public infrastructure for quite some time. So they have time to build that up. And then um, they also received a... Um, a very low interest loan from, from the state to build this. So they've got a very low payment back on it. So their, their debt on this will not be much. It's a matter of, um, can they handle, do they, do they have the capacity to keep it graded? And, and their analysis um, on this with a lot of financial advisors has said they will. So we're hopeful that's, that's true. We take care of it until it's conveyed to them. So that's on us until that point. All right, I, you mentioned mathematics and that's my question. Um, first of all, thank you for one of the most fascinating presentations we've oh. had ever at Rotary. Well, thank you. But you, you said you had 14 and you only had 12 employees uh, who applied and then two went to other employees. I didn't understand that oh, part. Okay. Sure. Uh, could you explain that a little more? Thank uh, you. Yeah, sure. So we have 14 houses. We opened it up and we had 12 employees. Um, we actually had more than 12 step forward immediately, a couple of them. Um, this is really clever. It's a lottery, right? So there are a couple cases where two spouses entered the lottery and to see which one got drawn first. And then the other one backed out, um, which is, that's just smart, I think. Um, so what happens is we open it up and we have, 12 cook buyers for 14 homes. This happened in West Baden too. The, the initial interest was a little slower. And then as they began to sell them, the interest picked up and people began to realize, oh, this is, this is real. They were able to buy a house. Now we can see them. We had to start this when those houses were under construction. Now they've got a green yard and they're built. They've, they have a certificate of occupancy. We're, putting, um, we're planting an oak tree in each front yard soon. Um, probably not until the heat of the summer is gone. But, uh, and so what we did is like, well, we'll give Cook employees a few more weeks, but if they don't step forward, then we go outside of Cook. And in this case, since the chamber was our partner, we said any employee of a Chamber of Commerce member can apply for a home. And we did an open house and we had offers the next day on them. So that's how we do that. I think it's healthy to probably have a mix of Cook employees and non-Cook employees. And so that's probably how it will go. We also opened it up after Cook, we opened it up to the school corporation first, to see if any school corporation employees wanted to buy, but none stepped forward at that time. Yeah. Now we know how you got the Taylor Swift ticket idea. That's right. Yeah. So with the TIF district, does that mean that other entities that would normally benefit from property taxes like the school corporation then are, are excluded from, from the revenues from this subdivision? In this case, yeah, the school corporation, I think was supportive of it because they, they were gonna get um, kids and get per pupil funding. But yeah, you take, if you, if you know TIF at all, there's going to be a base level of 
of property tax generated on the site. And then any increment from that for a period of time will go into a special fund. And so, yeah, there is, there is a chance the town, the town is pursuing that. It's not anything that we, that we even have an opinion on, but um, the town's pursuing it to pay for infrastructure to expand um, other housing areas as well um, to grow the population there. So, yeah. Thank you. Fred. Thank you. You know, we talk about servant leadership. I think we see an example of corporate leadership here and servant leadership. So, you know, job well done. Our hats off to the program committee for, again, bringing us an outstanding program. Obviously, this meeting wouldn't go on without a lot of help, and I would like to thank the people that helped today. Marilyn Wood was our greeter. Steve Engel did the introductions. Kyla, our Zoom host, we appreciate that. Jim Harvey for a reflection. This week's reporter is Jim, is, is Jim Bright and camera and mic operator and helping with the questions and answers is Tracy Stefanovich. Uh, by the way, there'll be a donation made to Stonebelt on, on the behalf of you for your, in honor of your presentation today. So we really, really appreciate that. And again, Tyler as our Zoom uh, and audio producer. Our next meeting is gonna have another stellar program. It's gonna be Shonda, uh, Stanford, Stanton, who is the women's IU uh, softball coach. So that'll be a very interesting. So please join me, Stan, and join me in the four-way test. Four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill, better friendship? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all? And fifth, is it fun? <laughs> <laughs>